Are inverters magic little boxes that make everything work, or are they battery sucking demons that you can do without? Keep watching while we share why you might want one, why you might not, and how to pick the right one if you do decide to get one. It's rare to see someone converting a van that hasn't added an inverter to the build list, probably because almost every van you see has one. But do you really need one? It's worth remembering that we're all different and our needs are different. So let's start by looking at what an inverter actually does. If you're off grid, the primary source of power is usually a leisure battery at either 12 volts or 24 volts DC. An inverter changes this to provide 220 to 240 volts AC as used by most mains appliances. But with many appliances, you'd then plug in your power brick to bring that voltage back down to 5 to 20 volts and back to DC. Not only does that sound a bit silly, but with the losses throughout the process, for efficiency, it's not very good use of your power. For these types of appliances, you'd be much better off using a DC to DC power converter. However, there are appliances that will only work on mains. But most of these do have alternatives that you could use on gas, diesel or lower voltage. So if you find the things you really need are actually powered more effectively from either 12 volts, LPG or diesel, then you may want to think carefully before stumping up for that inverter. But if you do decide you want one or need one, it's vital to remember you also need a suitable battery bank to keep it powered and recharging options to keep those batteries charged up. You can find out more in our other videos on 12 volt electrics and batteries linked up here and in the video notes. Let's take a quick look at an example. Let's say we had a 100 ampere hour AGM laser battery and we wanted to use a 2000 watt inverter for let's say a kettle. First, that 100 ampere hour battery quite likely isn't capable of supplying the 184 amps necessary to get 2000 watts of power without being damaged. But also given that we can only safely lose 50% of the battery's capacity, which equates to 600 watt hours, that gives us a grand total of 18 minutes use. And if we consider the efficiency of the inverter, let's guess at 90%, we'll find out later what some are actually that's only 16.2 minutes of use. Obviously you could go for a bigger battery bank or other technologies like lithium iron phosphate, like our Roma batteries, which you can see in our video linked up here. So you've decided you still want an inverter and are happy with the suitable battery bank and charging solution to keep it going. How do you pick the right one? Firstly, make sure you know the input power you need. For example, our 700 watt microwave needs an input power of around 1000 watts. But most appliances also have a peak higher than their average value when they're first switched on. So for a 1000 watt input microwave, this could be 1500 watts. Inverters are rated with a continuous power and a peak power. Make sure any appliances you plan to use are well within these limits. The next thing to consider is the waveform of the inverter. AC power we get at home or through a hookup cable is a pure sine wave, as it's generated using a turbine. The top inverters also generate a pure sine wave, which makes them compatible with most equipment. Very simple and generally older inverters create a square wave, and while simple equipment would work for this, it may cause inefficiencies in some equipment and more complex digital equipment may not work at all or with interference problems. A compromise between the two is modified sine wave which is getting closer to pure sine wave and therefore equipment may run better but some sensitive equipment may still struggle or behave strangely. We'll see an example of this later. When it comes to installing your inverter, there are a few things to remember. Using the right size cables and fuses for the 12 volt load you are going to pull from the battery and making sure the area around the inverter is well ventilated as they get pretty hot and less efficient the hotter they get. You also need to be conscious of the way you wire the main supply coming out of the inverter. Firstly, it may seem obvious, but you want to make sure you can't mistakenly try to charge the battery you're using to power the inverter with the power from the inverter. 
Plus, if you are looking to use the same equipment both from the inverter off-grid and from mains hookup, you need to be able to easily switch between the two. There are manual and automatic switches you can use for this purpose, or some inverters have this functionality built in. But for me, I keep it very simple. By having our hookup feeding the battery charger and mains heating, which I'd never want to run from the inverter, and then just one main socket positioned by the inverter, all the other sockets in the van run back to a plug which I can plug into either the hookup socket or the inverter as needed. Depending on your installation, you also need to consider where the best location the circuit is for your electrical RCD and circuit breakers. So now let's do some practical tests. We've got a range of inverters from 150 watt to 1500 watt and a mix of square wave, modified sine wave and pure sine wave. This video is brought to you thanks to our friends at Carlock, whose advanced multi-network GPS trackers we've used in both our vehicles, giving us reassurance and peace of mind, not only from being able to track them, but also alerts of vibration, movement or engine start to give us early warning of any attempted theft. You can see our full review in the video up here. Their trackers are available in their Amazon shop linked in the video description and cost from only £30 with a very reasonable subscription cost starting from only £6.90 a month. Using the promotional code EXPLORVANCL at the checkout will give you 10% off the purchase price and you can get extra days free trial subscription if you use EXPLORVANCL when activating the tracker. We're going to try each one out on an inductive load with this 60 watt fan and a resistive load with this surprisingly hard to find 28 watt incandescent lamp. For each inverter and each item we'll measure the actual power the inverter is giving out and the voltage and current going into it. Here are the results for the inductive load. As we can see all the inverters were giving out around the 60 watt rating of the fan. And using the voltage and the current it was drawing from the battery, we can calculate the power going into it, allowing us to calculate its efficiency. So, on an inductive load, we can see that the best performing was the 300 watt pure sine wave at 84% efficiency. The larger 1000 watt pure sine wave dropped the efficiency to 78%. The larger still and modified sine wave 1500 watt inverter was less efficient at 75% and finally the least efficient at 74% was the 150 watt square wave inverter. So this suggests to me that for an inductive load, sizing the inverter to the load you need pays dividends. If you're running something small on a big inverter, you are losing a reasonable amount of efficiency. It also shows how poor a square wave inverter is at providing an inductive load. Now let's do the same exercise with the resistive load of the lamp. Again, each inverter is giving around the 28 watt rated power of the lamp, and again, that pure sine wave 300 watt inverter is the most efficient at 76%. Next, the 150 watt square wave, followed by the 1500 watt modified, and then the 1000 watt pure sound wave very close together. To me, this suggests that square wave and modified sine wave seem to have less impact on efficiency for resistive load than they do on inductive load. But again, sizing the inverter correctly for the load helps the efficiency. Now let's try a load that is more realistic of what many would want to use, our microwave. Now it's debatable what type of load this is. The turntable motor will be inductive, the light bulb resistive, and as it most likely has power management, it probably has some capacitors in there too. It's rated at 1000 watts, and when run on hookup, it runs at that power. Obviously the 150 watt and 300 watt inverters aren't up to running this. Interestingly, when run on the 1000 watt pure sine wave inverter, it only provided 758 watts and on the 1500 watt modified sine wave inverter this provided only 614 watts and the efficiencies are both similar at 77 and 78 percent and the microwave worked heating a mug of water in less than a minute however what stood out was that the microwave didn't sound very happy at all on the modified sine wave inverter and i'd be worried it was being damaged 
Have a listen and see what you think. So what are our conclusions? Well, one, do you really need an inverter? Life may be simpler and cheaper without one. Two, if you do decide to get one, make sure you pick the right size and type of inverter for what you need. And three, make sure you size the rest of your system for the inverter you're going to use. I hope that's been helpful. As always, feel free to ask any questions in the comments or let us know your experiences with inverters. In our next video, we'll look specifically at our mistakes and successes when it comes to which inverters we bought and used and why we consciously chose a budget model over a big brand. Don't forget to check out our other videos on everything campervan and motorhome related, from solar to water, heating to gadgets, tyres to trips. If you like this video, please do hit the thumbs up. It really does help me to know what you like, and you can ask any questions or give feedback in the comments. If you want to make sure you don't miss any of our future videos, please hit the subscribe button and clicking the bell will give you a notification when a new video goes live. Finally, if you do decide to hit the thumbs down, it would be great if you could also leave a comment so I'd know what you didn't like.